Good morning, all. When we le uh, today's lecture, I have called, as you can see, uh, the mother of all forums, Civic Architecture in Rome under Trajan. And I think you'll see what I mean uh, when we look both at a Trajanic bath building and also the forum of Trajan in Rome, what I mean by mother of all forums. These were, were gargantuan buildings, bigger than anything that we have seen before, and interesting in all kinds of ways. We left off with Nerva, with the Emperor Nerva, and you'll recall that Nerva was old and in fact also relatively sickly uh, when he became Emperor of Rome. You'll also remember, and I remind you of his portrait on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll also recall that he was a member of the Senate and that he was chosen by the Senate, uh, one of their own, to become Emperor of Rome, the first emperor to come uh, from the senatorial ranks in the history of Rome. Uh, but because he, and he was very popular with the Senate, but Nerva recognized quite early on that although he was popular with the Senate and with the aristocracy, uh, he was not a favorite of the army. Uh, and he realized that was not a good position to be in, and so he wisely decided very early on that he would select the most popular military man and the most highly successful military man in Rome, a man by the name of Trajan, as his heir. And so Nerva adopts Trajan, and you see Trajan's portrait on the right-hand side of the screen. Nerva adopts Trajan in 97 AD, so that in 98, when Nerva dies, because he dies after only 16 months in office, when Nerva dies, uh, Trajan succeeds him without contest. Trajan was an extraordinary emperor for Rome. Uh, there are a number of important points about Trajan that should be made uh, that have an impact on our understanding and analysis of his architecture. One of those is he's the first Roman emperor uh, to be born outside of Italy. He was born in Spain, the first emperor born in Spain. Uh, that's not to say that Spain was the boondocks by any stretch of the imagination. Spain had already been colonized by Rome and was very highly developed with regard to its civilization. He also came to power as a relatively young man. He was only 45 years of age, a couple of years younger than Obama. Uh, and consequently, he was in very, and he was in very good physical shape, uh, and so he had the physical uh, wherewithal uh, to be the kind of energetic emperor that Rome needed at this particular point. He uh, undertook many military campaigns and very successfully, and he was the emperor that extended Rome to its furthest reaches, to its greatest borders, to its most extensive borders uh, during his reign. Uh, and actually, these were borders that were never gone beyond. Uh, after this point, we'll see that the Emperor Hadrian consolidates uh, the extent of the empire as reached by Trajan, and no one ever takes it beyond that. So this is going to be the <coughs> furthest extent of the empire that we'll see in the course of the semester. And he was also extremely wise when it came to his choice of the kinds of buildings that he wanted to put up because he followed in the footsteps of Vespasian and Titus by favoring major public architecture in Rome and by eschewing uh, private architecture. He wanted, above all, to disassociate himself from uh, Nero and from Domitian, <laughs> who had favored palatial architecture, as you'll recall. And so he, bi he builds public architecture in Rome. Uh, and allies himself in this regard to such earlier emperors as Augustus uh, and as, uh, as uh, Claudius and as the Flavian dynasts. And we're going to see that in his building projects today. Like so many other emperors, uh, when he came, first came to power, he looked around to see which buildings had fallen into disrepair. Uh, and he decided to restore uh, as many of those as he could. And, and he chose very carefully. Again, he obviously did not choose buildings of uh, Nero, uh, many of which had already been destroyed in any case, uh, but rather looked back further. In fact, dug deep into the Republic, a time, a simpler time in many respects, and a time prior to the shenanigans uh, of the more monarchically minded emperors <laughs> like Nero and Vespasian, uh, uh, Nero and Domitian, excuse me. 
uh, and he restored buildings uh, from the Republic and from the Augustan period. Uh, and he looked back, for example, to the Forum of Caesar in Rome, the Forum Iulium, which you all know uh, well, and we've talked about it before, and I'm not going to discuss it in any detail today. Uh, just to remind you that it began to be restored, that is the Forum of Julius Caesar, under Domitian, and that that restoration was completed by Trajan some, at some point during his reign between 98 and 117 A.D. And I remind you of that here. You'll recall its location uh, right next to the Victor Emmanuel, Victor Emmanuel Monument in Rome. Uh, you'll remember that even though it was restored by Domitian and Trajan, uh, it has fallen on hard times. And if you look at the Temple of Venus Genetrix, uh, you see that all that survives besides the podium and the staircase are three columns uh, from that restored version by Trajan. Uh, you see the same three columns over here, and then you'll recall the great open space with colonnades on either side, and then the market area, the shops or tabernae on the left. I showed you this view as well, uh, uh, pointing out one of the architectural blocks uh, that belong to the restored building, the building under Trajan. And you can see that Trajan continues this interest in uh, ornamentation that was uh, characteristic of the Flavian period, very ornamental architectural decoration, very deeply carved uh, with a strong contrast between light and dark. So uh, he does continue this Flavian interest in very elaborate uh, architectural decoration. <laughs> Uh, you'll remember that the Temple of Venus Genetrix in the Forum of Julius Caesar had a pediment that had in the center of that pediment a scene depicting Venus rising from the sea. Uh, and there is other Venus imagery, uh, and I show you a detail, and it's on your monument list, I show you a detail of part of a frieze that depicts uh, <coughs> cupids, winged chubby winged babies, as you can see here, cupids, who are carrying the arms. You can see one of them with a sword sheath over here. They are carrying the arms and armor of Mars. Mars, of course, the consort of Venus, and Mars making reference also to military victory. Uh, this frieze, as far as we can tell, does belong to the Trajanic renovation of the building, but it probably does look back uh, to, earlier, to an earlier Julian frieze uh, that decorated the original <coughs> temple in Rome. From this, from, and I use that uh, restoration of the Temple of Venus Genetrix in the form of Julius Caesar as an example of the kind of restoration work that Trajan embarked on at the beginning of his principate. But much more important to us today are two, building, two buildings, uh, the first a bath and the second a forum, that are examples of the devotion that Trajan had to public architecture during his reign. And I show you a view here, in fact, a plan of the so-called Baths of Trajan in Rome that were dedicated in AD 109. As you can see from the monument list, we know the architect in this particular case. Uh, it is Apollodorus of Damascus, and his name says a lot about him, Apollodorus from, from Damascus, modern Syria. Uh, so it's very interesting. We have an emperor from Spain and an architect from Syria who work together. This is a sign that things are beginning to change in the Roman Empire as the Romans, as Trajan extends those borders even further. It brings in an even more uh, multifaceted, uh, multifaceted civilizations around the world, uh, and talent begins to pour into Rome from all of those places. Apollodorus of Damascus, as we'll see today, was an extraordinary architect right up there with Severus and Keller and with Rabirius. In fact, one could argue even the equal <laughs> of Rabirius. And what's particularly interesting is that, that uh, Apollodorus of Damascus, like Severus and Keller before him, appears to have been, above all, a great engineer. Uh, he actually accompanied Trajan on Trajan's military <laughs> Uh, campaigns uh, and served as Trajan's military architect. So his first commissions were building bridges. I'm going to show you a uh, reference to one today. Building bridges or building forts and camps uh, on Trajan's military campaigns uh, and then uh, using that expertise, uh, ingratiating himself with the 
uh, emperor who sees that he is enormously talented because Trajan was on the Trajan participated in these campaigns himself, seeing how talented he was, and then putting him in charge of his building projects in Rome, which is really quite interesting. And so these projects are not o only aesthetically <coughs> pleasing and fascinating, but also show extraordinary uh, engineering skill on the part of the major designer, namely Apollodorus of Damascus. Now these baths of Trajan are very interesting in all kinds of ways. You can already see by looking at the plan <laughs> their location. They are located on the Esquiline <coughs> Hill uh, and part of the Oppian Hill, which I don't think I've mentioned before, O-P-P-I-A-N, the smaller Oppian Hill. And the baths of Titus, that, well, let me, uh, let me remind you first that the uh, the Domus Aurea of Nero was built in part on the Esquiline Hill, and you'll recall the so-called Esquiline Wing, which is the one wing of Nero's Domus Aurea that is still preserved underground. Uh, you'll recall that after Nero's Domnatio Memoriae and the coming to power of the Flavian dynasty, that Vespasian and Titus and even Domitian uh, built their, built, raised to the ground uh, Nero's buildings, Vespasian did that, and then he and Titus and Domitian built new buildings on top of those and chose uh, to make those buildings the kind of public buildings that the citizenry as a whole would enjoy, what, from the Colosseum and Amphitheater uh, to the Baths of Titus. Uh, and you see again the Baths of Titus here, located right again on top of this area uh, that originally belonged to Nero's Domus Aurea. Trajan follows suit. He not only is interested in public architecture like Vespasian and Titus before him, but he follows their lead in building these buildings on top of earlier structures now destroyed uh, of Nero. So it's again the same message, giving back to the people uh, the land that Nero had taken illegally uh, from Rome during his reign. Uh, the Baths of Trajan are based in large part on the plan of the Baths of Titus with some additions, but you can see the extraordinary difference in scale. The Baths of Titus were not small. Uh, and yet the Baths of Trajan uh, are at least three, if not four or more uh, times the size uh, of the Baths of Titus. So this tells us something again about the grandiosity of the vision of Trajan, about the, uh, the funds that he had at his disposal, and he got those funds in large part because of all these military victories in which he took all kinds of spoils and booty which he used to fund his building campaigns in Rome. Uh, and it also tells us something about his ambitions. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that we never had big buildings before. You can think back way to the beginning of the semester when we talked about Julius Caesar and his architecture and his bragging that he had built uh, a, or, or one of the authors of that period tells us that uh, Julius Caesar had built a temple to Mars the biggest in the world. So in its own day, it was <coughs> supposedly the biggest in the world. Uh, but we're getting even more ambitious with vis-a-vis -vis scale, and I think, perhaps again I'm psychoanalyzing uh, Trajan too much, but I think the fact that this is a man who had the uh, ambitions that he did to extend the empire to its furthest reaches uh, seems, to go, seems to be in keeping with the kind of man who would want to make the buildings in Rome that he built a kind of microcosm of that hugely expanded empire. With regard to the plan of the baths, you will see that it follows the so-called imperial bath type that was initiated uh, w uh, by the baths of Titus, at least with regard to uh, baths that still are still preserved. I mentioned to you when we talked about the baths of Titus, there may have been an earlier bath of Nero that actually followed this same imperial bath form, but we're not absolutely sure about <coughs> its plan that is the Neronian baths, they existed, but we're not absolutely sure about their plan. But if we look back at the uh, baths of Titus, you'll remember that what made them distinctive and what made them differ from the earlier Stavian baths or forum baths at Pompeii was the way in which they placed the bathing block in the center rather than to the side, uh, that they arranged the main rooms, the, uh, the, uh, the 
tepidarium, the frigidarium, and the caldaria in this case in axial relationship to one another. And then all the other rooms of the bath were displayed around those in a symmetrical way. So axiality and symmetry reign supreme. Uh, and then otherwise, we saw here the rest of the precinct with an elaborate entranceway over here. We see roughly the same uh, in the Baths of Trajan, in that again, the bathing block is located right at the center of the structure, and the main rooms are aligned with one, one another axially. If you look up to the, where it says Baths of Trajan, that at the northern end is the entrance into the baths. You enter from there into N, which is a natatio or swimming pool, a piscina, uh, and then you can see that is surrounded by columns. On axis with the swimming pool uh, is the frigidarium at F, uh, and you can see uh, just like that of the Baths of Titus, it is a groin vaulted room, uh, a triple groin vaulted room, as you can see by the three X's over the rectangular area. Uh, it has a kind of a, a, an apse or exedra at the uppermost part through which one comes from the natatio into the frigidarium, and you can see that is screened by columns. Then from there into the fairly simple uh, rectangularly shaped tepidarium that serves more as a kind of passageway uh, from the frigidarium into <coughs> C, which of course is the caldarium or the warmest room, the sauna, of the baths, that also has a rectangular shape, but with these radiating uh, alcoves, radiating alcoves that we're going to see are screened by columns, and they are of course facing the southern end where the sun is, uh, and that would of course help to heat the caldarium as well. Uh, and then what we see, what we see though with regard to the baths of Trajan that make them differ from the baths of Titus and are part of this evolution of imperial bath architecture in Rome uh, is the fact that the bathing block is placed in this very large rectangular precinct. Uh, and this large rectangular precinct has a series of rooms around it, as you can see, real rooms, and rooms that take all kinds of shapes. Many of them are uh, these a, a, a hemicycle type shapes, screened uh, by col from uh, with columns from the larger uh, uh, central space, but some of them also look like the tabernae uh, that we've <coughs> become used to in plan. Uh, we see all of those there, and these were used, as far as we can determine, as meeting halls, lecture halls, Greek and Latin libraries. So this is this, this ex extension of the bath from being just a place where you went to, to get to, uh, you know, for wellness essentially, to, um, to bathe and to uh, relax and to uh, have social interaction with your friends. Uh, they are adding an intellectual element to the bath uh, buildings so that you can also go there if you want to read, if you want to go to the library, read Greek books, read Latin books, uh, go to lectures, go to seminars, have conversations, intellectual conversations, uh, are also beginning to happen here. So the bath becomes even more uh, of a, a mecca for people who are interested in intellectual life as well as uh, bathing and social life, which is a very important development culturally for the, the Romans. Uh, note here also this great hemicycle down here, which is part of the bath building, a hemicycle that had seats on it, which probably served for performances of whatever kind uh, that would have taken place here. So that's another interesting addition uh, to the bathing scene and should remind you of the kind of hemicycles that we saw, for example, in the Sanctuary of Fortuna Primigenia at Palestrina or the a sanctuary of Hercules at Tivoli, where, where they also had those performance areas. So bringing in some of those elements from sanctuary design uh, into uh, bath design in the baths of Trajan in Rome. The baths of Trajan, uh, some parts of them still exist, uh, but scattered. Uh, and in fact, they are located now in a kind of a pleasant garden area, as you can see here. This is a Google Earth view uh, that shows you their proximity to the Colosseum. We see the edge of the Colosseum over here, so the Esquiline Hill in large part. Uh, and you can just barely make out here, if you look, you see this curved wall? Down here, that curved wall is, in fact, that hemicycle with the, with the theatrical performances that I showed you just before. 
Uh, and that is actually the entrance for anyone going to Rome over break. That's actually the entrance to the Domus Aurea. Uh, if it's opened, it periodically closes sometimes if things are falling down. But if it's open, that's how one gets there. Uh, and over here, you can actually see this is the, I may have shown this to you before, but this is actually uh, the oculus of the uh, octagonal room of Nero's Domus Aurea. You can see it if you wander through this park. You can see it from above with a grate on top of it, as well as down below if you visit uh, the palace itself. And then up here, you can see another, just right up above my finger, you can see another curved wall, and there's another one somewhere down here uh, that are part of those, uh, those, those curved rooms, those hemicycle-shaped hemicycle rooms uh, that are, that are uh, these lecture halls and meeting halls and so on. So, and actually that one, the one that's up here, uh, actually has um, niches in the wall with shelves. Uh, which indicates to us that that was used as one of the libraries. The scrolls would have been placed on those shelves and then have cupboards in front of them. So one can see remains. It's made out of uh, uh, concrete faced with brick. One can see remains uh, on the top of that hill. Uh, but a model over here gives you a better sense of what it looked like in antiquity. We're again looking at that large hemicycle that served at, with its seats that served for performances here. We're looking at the outer precinct wall. We can see the semi-domes of some of the hemicycles here. Uh, and we can also see the bathing block uh, at the uppermost part, the entranceway, the courtyard surrounded by columns, which is where the pool or natatio was located. Uh, the uh, covered area here was the Frigidarium, then the Tepidarium. The Caldarium is here, and here you can see those radiating alcoves with columns uh, that open them up uh, for vistas and the like, as well as to the warmth of the sun. So an incredible bathing uh, establishment, uh, and one that has uh, taken us a step further in the evolution of imperial bath architecture in Rome and will serve as the major model for the two most uh, famous and much better preserved uh, baths in Rome, and that is the Baths of Caracalla and the Baths of Diocletian, which we'll look at later in the semester. But I'd like to turn from the Trajanic Baths to the unquestionably the most important public building uh, that was commissioned by Trajan during his reign, and I can't overemphasize enough uh, the importance of this building in the history of Roman architecture, and we're going to see that it is two-part in the sense that it has, it is a forum, it has the forum proper, and it also has markets appended to us. They are done in a different architectural style and herald something very important, a very important development in Roman architecture that's going to be carried further uh, by uh, Trajan's uh, successors. The, what we're looking at here is a spectacular aerial view of the part of Rome in which the Forum of Trajan finds itself. Uh, we, are looking, uh, we are looking at buildings that we have looked at before so we can get our bearings. This is, of course, the uh, wedding cake of Victor Emmanuel over here. You can see uh, a part of the oval piazza designed by Michelangelo of the Campidoglio. You can also see, any, what's this down here? Forum, met Wendy? The Julian. the Julian Forum, the Forum of Julius Caesar, much lower ground level uh, than the rest of the city today. And you can actually see those three columns from the temple that I showed you just before, as well as the tabernae of the Julian Forum. And note the relationship of the <laughs> Julian Forum to the Trajanic Forum. He's restoring Julius Caesar's Forum at the same time he's building his own. Uh, I can also show you here, uh, if you look right above my hand, you can see uh, the um, uh, Piazza Venezia and the Palazzo Venezia. If you look at the center of that building right over the doorway, there's a balcony. That is the famous Mussolini balcony. That's the balcony from which Mussolini made all his speeches with his followers gathering in the Piazza Venezia. Uh, and from that, from the Piazza Venezia, the street uh, that goes from there to the Piazza del Popolo is the Corso, the race course, the Corso of Rome, which is one of the major streets of Rome.
Rome, one of the major shopping streets of Rome, as well as one of the major thoroughfares that takes you, if you go down it halfway, take a right, you are at the Via Condotti and ultimately at the Piazza di Spagna or the Spanish Steps, which of course is a trek <laughs> that everybody who visits Rome uh, follows that path to see the Spanish Steps. Over here, the forum that we're going to be talking about today, the Forum <coughs> of Trajan, much of that forum uh, is underground, uh, and some of it was turned into a garden, as you can see here, Pleasant Park, uh, as you can see here. Uh, here we are looking at some of the columns from the basilica that's part of that forum, from the very well-preserved column of Trajan. Uh, and also over here, we'll see uh, the markets of the forum. But I just wanted you to get your bearings, again, in terms of where it's situated in Rome and what it looks like today from the air. Although it is changing all the time, and I wanted to show you a Google Earth image as well, because this is much more up to date than the aerial view that I showed you just before. Uh, and you'll see the same buildings. You'll see the Victor Emanuel Monument. You'll see part of the Campidoglio. You'll see uh, the, uh, the Mussolini balcony and the Corso. Uh, and you'll see the Column of Trajan and part of the Basilica. But what you see here is that park has been replaced by structures uh, because they are excavating. I've mentioned this before. They, they are excavating uh, more of this now with the hope of someday rejoining uh, the Roman Forum with the Imperial Fora. That may not be able to happen because of traffic concerns, but it is certainly something that's on the drawing board. And at the very least right now, without narrowing the street, the main Via dei Fori Imperiali, they are uh, doing excavation in that park area, and you can see what they've brought up. This is not ancient. It's actually mostly medieval uh, houses. I hope, I hope there are no medievalists among you, but I hope they'll eventually realize that these are, well, who's to say, uh, that, that they should probably remove these as well and take us back uh, to the original form of Trajan. I hope that happens someday. They're not very distinctive. If one looks at them, they're just mainly rectangular rooms. Uh, but nonetheless, they're at that medieval level now, and the question is whether they're going to go down any further. But here you can see not only the remains of the Forum of Trajan, but also the Forum of Augustus. Here's the Temple of Mars Ultor, that great precinct wall that divided it from the <laughs> Sabora, also a a visible here. And here we see the great hemicycle that we'll look at today of Trajan's Forum, behind it the markets of Trajan. It's important for us to look back at the general plan of the imperial fora uh, to see where the Forum of Trajan fits in. We have already looked at the Forum of Julius Caesar with its Temple of Venus Genetrix. We have looked at the Forum of Augustus with its Temple of Mars Ultor. Remember the uh, exedri on either side of that temple, the embracing arms that were new at that time and an important component of the Forum of Augustus. Vespasian adds his Forum Pacus over here. Uh, Domitian uh, adds a narrow forum. Uh, the, the so-called Forum Transitorium that served as a point of transit between the Roman Forum and the Sabora. Uh, here it is at, at, at he puts a temple to his uh, patron goddess Minerva uh, in that uh, forum. Uh, but it is at his death it is taken over by Nerva and <coughs> renamed the Forum of Nerva. I mentioned to you when we talked about the Forum Transitorium that Domitian also had his eye on this property over here. He had, grand, he, has, he had his schemes as grandiose for public architecture at one point as for palatial architecture, but palatial architecture won out and he put all of his effort into the palace on the Palatine Hill and never realized uh, any construction in this area. When Trajan became emperor, uh, he decided that he would, would, again, focus on public architecture and that he would build a forum like none other before it. Uh, and so he begins to do that. Now that was no small feat in this particular part of the city because most of this area was occupied by a hill, uh, the so-called Quirinal, Q-U-I-R-I-N-A-L, the Quirinal Hill uh, in Rome, occupied most of this space. So what he needed to do, it's great to have an architect engineer in your back pocket, 
Uh, so he set Apollodorus of Damascus to work. He said, you're a great engineer. All you need to do is take down a good part of the Quirinal Hill to make way uh, for this great forum that I want to build. And lo and behold, uh, Apollodorus was absolutely up to the job. Uh, and that's exactly what he sets out to do. He <coughs> removes 125 feet of the Quirinal Hill in order to make way for the Forum of Trajan. And that very uh, number, 125 feet, is actually commemorated in the Column of Trajan because the Column of Trajan was built to that very same height, 125 feet, to show you as you stand in the Forum how much of that hill had to be cut back in order to make way for the Forum. You can see by looking at this plan of the imperial fora as a whole, and this is our, not only did Trajan take the empire to its furthest extent, this is the last forum uh, that was added to the imperial fora in Rome. Uh, you can see by looking at it in connection to the others that it, if you count it plus the markets, which you see wending their way up what was left of the Quirinal Hill here in plan, if you compare that to the others, you can see that the Forum of Trajan and the markets of Trajan were almost as large as all of the other fora not counting the Roman fora, but all of the other imperial fora together, which gives you some sense of why I call this the mother of all forums. Now we're going to look at uh, the plan of this, and I'm going to show you an individual plan in a moment. But what I want to say while this is still on the screen uh, is that I want you to look at the exedrae that you see on either side of the main space of the forum and on either side of the basilica over here. Uh, these are not coincidental. They are certainly meant to make reference to the exedrae of Augustus's forum. Trajan modeled himself after Augustus. He became a kind of neo-Augustus. He uh, took on Augustus' ha hairstyle uh, and his manners, uh, and so he was trying to associate himself in his life with Augustus. He's doing it here also through architecture by placing those exedrae on either side of his forum. Here's a plan of the forum itself on the left-hand side of the screen where we can see all of its major features. You'd enter into the forum down here. Uh, there was a very elaborate entranceway here, and you can see that the, the facade is actually not straight, but convex, convex. A convex facade, which is very interesting, curved facade, uh, with an elaborate entranceway over here. Uh, the entrance into the main part of the forum, rectangular in shape. There's a base here for an equestrian statue of Trajan. The exedrae on either side mimicking those of the Forum of Augustus. Colonnades also on either side and some additional columns here. And we're going to see that just as in Augustus's Forum, another reference back to Augustus, that the columns in this main area are Corinthian uh, below, but in the second tier there are figures. Not figures of caryatids, but different kinds of figures, and I'm going to show you those soon. Over here, the basilica, which is perpendicular to the forum proper. This is quite different from the forum at Pompeii, where you'll remember the basilica was splayed off uh, to the side. Here we have it as a more integral part of the forum and perpendicular to the main space here. It's a very large basilica. It takes the name of Trajan's family. His family name was Ulpius, U-L-P-I-U-S. This is the Basilica Ulpia in Rome with a central nave uh, and, and side aisles, a couple of side aisles around it, so a veritable forest of columns, uh, and then other exedrae, matching exedrae, or in this case, apses on either end. Uh, then through here, uh, you see the location of the Column of Trajan in a small uh, a small uh, piazza, and to left and right, libraries, Greek and Latin libraries, and then at the end, a temple. Uh, we don't know what Trajan actually, tra the, 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 uh, temp the northern end of the structure was not completed at Trajan's death, and we don't know uh, if he would have put a temple there. It's highly likely because what forum have we seen without a temple at the short end? They all had them, so it's a good guess. Uh, the Trajan had that in mind too, but the temple that was built there was actually built after his death <laughs> by his successor Hadrian, a temple that Hadrian put up to honor Trajan and also Trajan's wife Plotina, P-L-O-T-I-N-A. 
Now we know quite a bit, a lot of the forum, some of the forum is still preserved uh, and we have evidence for other parts of it that are not preserved. This entrance gate down here, believe it or not, we have coins uh, that have an entrance gate on them and nicely they say, fortunately, they say down below, Forum Trion, Forum of Trajan. So uh, putting two and two together, uh, we have to go on the assumption that what we are looking at here is a rendition <laughs> on a coin of the entrance gate into the Forum of Trajan, Forum Trion. Uh, and if we look at it here, we see some interesting things. We see, first of all, that it has a single arcuation in the center, so one doorway. It has a series of bays that have in them uh, what we call idiculi, A-E-D-I-C-U-L-A-E, -E, idiculi. Uh, which are little temple, little temple fronts that are niches with little temple fronts around them with columns and pediments. And then you can see statuary inside those. So a series of bays decorated with these idiculi with statues. Then a series of circles with blobs in them. I think those series of circles with blobs in them are probably the re uh, portraits represented on shields because we have, act we have remains of actual portraits on shields from the inside of the forum. So that seems to be the case here as well. And then in the uppermost part, we see that the, the gate uh, it looks very much like an arch in the sense that it supports a quadriga at the top, and that quadriga represents two people, possibly the emperor, again, we're dealing with blobs here, we have to do the best we can to interpret them, uh, but they seem to be probably the emperor and possibly victory crowning him the way we saw victory crowning Titus in his chariot on his arch. Six horses in this particular case, and then on either side trophies, these tree trunks decorated with captured arms and armor. <laughs> Uh, and uh, prob uh, we're not absolutely sure what's surrounding them in this case, whether they're prisoners or Roman soldiers. So this gives you a very good idea of the entrance gate into this uh, structure. And I also want to point out, if you look very closely at the columns and the elements above them in the attic, you can see that the columns project and the attic seems to have projecting entablature. So it looks as if we have the kind of scheme here that we saw in the Forum Transitorium with that wall decorated with columns that project out of the wall and that have projecting entablature, giving this undulation, uh, mo undulating movement from projecting to receding, projecting to receding across uh, the facade of the entrance gate. The figures that were located on the uh, upper tier of the center of the main body of this forum, again, were not caryatids or female figures, but rather male figures, male figures of captured Dacians, because the war uh, that Trajan uh, had that enabled him to, fu to celebrate and to fund this building was his wars against the Dacians, D-A-C-I-A-N-S. Dacia, ancient Dacia, modern Romania today. Uh, Trajan had two military campaigns there, one from 102 to 10, to 10 excuse me, one, the first one from 101 to 102, the second one from 105 to 107. He was victorious in both of those. Uh, and he, uh, he, this forum was built from the spoils of that war to honor his victory over the Dacians. Uh, and we see, therefore, that the figures that are in the uppermost tier of the main body of the forum are depictions of captured uh, Dacians, of Dacian prisoners uh, brought back to Rome. You see two of them here, here a headless figure, here a much more complete figure. The headless figure is still at, can be seen uh, on the site and the one on the left-hand side of the screen now in the Vatican Museums in Rome. The one on the left gives you a better sense of what these look like in antiquity. You can tell that these are not Romans wearing uh, leggings, a tunic, a fringed mantle that the Romans did not wear, uh, a long fringed mantle, and then above you see that he has, uh, unlike Trajan's closely cropped, August cropped Augustine type hairstyle, you can see he has very long hair uh, and also a beard. Uh, and this, this identifies him as a very different indent sort of um, a, a boots that seem to be made out of suede or felt of some sort. So a very different kind of image. Clearly, uh, these are, again, the Dacian prisoners, one after another, uh, aligning that second 
tier. And for any of you interested in the fact that the Romans made uh, nearly exact duplicates of things, mechanical copies, uh, you can see in this particular statue, we rarely have this preserved, so it's an interesting example uh, of these points. You see these little ex excess pieces of marble. Uh, the Romans had created a kind of pointing machine uh, which they used to make uh, exact replicas of originals. Uh, and they usually, when the statue was done, they would usually obviously uh, take these away, I mean carve them away, uh, which they didn't do. This one probably was not used for some reason. Uh, it was copied and never put up on the building, and so those points uh, still remain. This is a model of the Forum of Trajan uh, as it would have looked in antiquity with that convex entranceway, the location of the equestrian statue, the exedrae on either side. Here you can imagine the Dacians in the second tier, uh, the uh, roofed Basilica Ulpia here, the Column of Trajan <coughs> flanked by the Latin and Greek libraries, and then over here uh, the temple to divine <coughs> Trajan. The plan again, uh, and uh, here we can. Here I just want to mention, looking back at that plan, that there was also another elaborate entranceway from the main part of the forum into the Basilica Ulpia on its long side. And once again, how fortunate we are that we have a co have coins that say Basilica Ulpia, Basilica Ulpia. So we can <laughs> guess, I think, quite uh, accurately, that this must be the entranceway to the Basilica Ulpia. Here we see something different. We see three openings, not arcuated openings, but trabeated openings, straight lintels above. But look again in the way in which they're, they're, they're represented. It looks like they're quite solid and that they project into the spectator's space. So again, this idea of projection, recession, projection, recession across this facade. This is very important because, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Roman architecture using the traditional language of Greek architecture ultimately developed something that we call a Baroque trend in Roman architecture, and you see it happening here in Rome based on the experiments uh, of Domitian's Forum Transitorium. Uh, and you can see uh, that same, roughly that same scheme here. Up above, once again, a chariot, in this case a four-horse chariot seemingly with one figure, and a series of standards uh, being hold, held possibly by Roman soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the Forum of Trajan has been the professional, the, the life work of uh, a professor uh, formerly of, the, of Northwestern University, James Packer, uh, who spent a very long time uh, pulling together all the evidence that the Forum of Trajan still <laughs> provides uh, to allow a very good reconstruction of what that forum <coughs> looked like. It's computer generated. Uh, I urge you all to look at it. If you just, if you just Google uh, James Packer Forum of Trajan UCLA, uh, because that's the, or the Getty, uh, either of those two, because UCLA and the Getty supported this work, you will be able to see computer simulations of, uh, uh, of his work. Uh, there's also a book by James Packer on the Forum of Trajan that's on reserve for this course. I send you to it less for the form of Trajan, but for any of you working on city plans, again, this could be a very inspiring uh, book to look at. I, not that I expect you to come up with something like this, uh, but nonetheless, I think it can give you an idea uh, of what one can do as one thinks about uh, designing one's own city. He has, he has done enough research to allow a very accurate reconstruction of what this forum would have looked like. We're looking at the entranceway into the Basilica Ulpia here. Uh, we are looking at uh, the marble. You can see real marble and variegated marbles brought from all over the world. So Trajan continues the Flavian tradition of bringing marbles from all over, from places outside of Italy, from Africa, from Asia Minor, uh, from Egypt, and so on, for the decoration of these buildings and an interest in multicolored marbles as facing. Uh, we see also up here the Dacian prisoners, and between them, in this instance, these shields. Uh, with portraits on them. We have remains of some of those, so that's an accurate reconstruction, the same sort of thing that we saw on the entranceway. Then up there, an inscription, a couple, uh, some several other Dacians, and uh, some other decoration at the apex. I'm going to show you just a few of these quickly from Packer's book. Uh, you see here a corridor with a barrel <coughs> vault, uh, stuccoed and painted, lots of statuary. There would have been lots of honorific statuary. Uh, in this structure. Sometimes instead of the shields with portraits between the Dacians, we see piles of captured arms and armor, as you can see in that view. 
Uh, here a couple more showing again the marble decoration of the walls, a very, a very a varied in color. Here uh, niches with portraits. Over here, more shields with portraits. And here you can see some of the uh, sculptural remains, uh, some parts of a, 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 breast, a, a military figure in a breastplate, a man, both of them headless, a man uh, in a toga. And over here, part of one of these decorative shields with uh, a portrait. We actually think this is a portrait of Nerva, <coughs> portrait of Nerva that would have been placed inside this shield and hung on the upper part of the wall above the columns. And this, this is uh, important and on your monument list. This is a view of the uh, Basilica Ulpia in Rome and what it, what it would have looked like in antiquity. You can see it conforms to basilican architecture that we've looked at before uh, with a central nave uh, divided by, two, by its two side aisles, in this case, as you'll recall, in plan. Uh, and uh, those are Corinthian. Uh, capitals, as you can see down here. Uh, you can see also that it's a, it's a gargantuan structure. Look at the size of the, pe of the people and the men in their togas uh, and the building itself. And it had a flat roof with a coffered ceiling. And you can see that it had a clear story. We've talked about the clear story before. We saw it in the House of the Mosaic Atrium. For example, the clear story, which is the opening up of the wall, uh, in this case through uh, ionic columns, to see the vistas that lie beyond and to let light into the structure. And you can see the vista that lies beyond is the column of Trajan and one of the libraries. This is a, a, a photograph that I'm incredibly proud of uh, because I took it from on top of the Column of Trajan. Uh, it's not that difficult to climb the Column of Trajan because there's a spiral staircase in the center of it that goes up to the top. The part, the part that's hard is getting permission to get in there. It's always locked and you have to get special permission to do that. So I did it only once, but it was a great thing to do. Uh, and you go way up to the top and you can look down, you can see fantastic views of Rome, uh, but you can also get a very good sense of what the Basilica Ulpia looks like today. Uh, not much, uh, but you can see the central space. You can see some of the columns. We can tell that those columns were gray granite. So again, this interest in contrasting marbles, gray granite with white marble uh, in the Basilica Ulpia and elsewhere. And you can also see the relationship between modern ground level, which is much higher, and ancient ground level, and the possibilities that still remain if they want to excavate uh, this part of the city, what more of the Forum of Trajan may be able to be seen. Some of it can actually be seen under the street, and Packer and others have actually gone in uh, to look at what is there, which is what has enabled him to make the kind of accurate reconstructions that he has. Everywhere in this monument there are references. Yes, this is a forum. Yes, forums have practical purposes. They're a place to, uh, to, um, for people to meet and to market and to uh, conduct law uh, cases and so on in the basilica. But this monument reminds you again and again and again and again that it is a, uh, a, a, a monument in stone to Trajan's victories over the Dacians. And not only do we see those Dacians as we looked at before, but we see lots of other imagery that refers to military victory. This is a fragment of what we think was a frieze uh, in the Basilica Ulpia that depicts victories, female personifications of victory, winged, uh, either kneeling at candelabra or over here, this woman kneeling on the back of a bull. Uh, you can see that she's winged. She's holding the snout of that bull back. She's got a knife in her right hand, and she is about to slit the throat of the bull. Uh, and she is doing this to not only to not only is victory over the Dacians being marked here, uh, but she is also representing the sacrifice that takes place in honor of that victory uh, by uh, being shown. Uh, depicting uh, killing the bull. Back to the plan once again, just to remind you that when we leave the Basilica Ulpia, a doorway also in its long side, we end up in this small plaza where the temple, where the Column of Trajan is located, flanked by Greek and Latin libraries on axis with the equestrian, uh, on axis with the entranceway, the equestrian <laughs> statue of Trajan, the other entranceway, the column, and ultimately the uh, temple at the very end, the temple ultimately to divine Trajan. This is a model of what we think the library may have looked like, or both of the libraries may have looked like from the outside. Fairly s a small 
tallish uh, square buildings with a portico in the front, and then most important, uh, a balcony over here. Why a balcony? So that you could come out and look at the Column of Trajan and read some of the scenes that encircled it. This is a reconstruction from Packer, again, uh, showing what he thinks the interior of one of these libraries might have looked like. It looks larger here than it actually was, uh, but you can get a sense of it with the reading tables, with the uh, scrolls inside these cabinets here, uh, with the statuary, and in this case, he believes uh, that it had a vaulted roof, as you can see uh, on top. The Column of Trajan, uh, you see it here in two views. Uh, an extraordinary work of art, extremely well preserved. Why so well preserved? Well, likely because Pope Sixtus V in the Renaissance uh, used this column and also the column of the later emperor Marcus Aurelius as important nodes uh, in his reconstruction of the city of Rome. Uh, and what he did, however, at that time was that he took the statues of Trajan uh, that would have stood on this one and Marcus Aurelius on the other and replaced them with statues of Peter and Paul. Uh, and it's Peter who's on the column of Trajan and Paul who is on the column of Marcus Aurelius. But you can see how well preserved they are here. The column shaft rests on a base decorated with arms and armor, Dacian arms and armor. Uh, with, you know, with a statue of Trajan uh, up at the uh, bronze statue of Trajan at the uppermost part. But what's particularly interesting is the sculpture. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but I want you to know about it because it does tell us something about architecture, as we'll see. It's a spiral frieze, done all in marble, of course, that wraps from <coughs> the base of the column all the way up to the top. And it tells in documentary form uh, the exploits, the military exploits of Trajan in his two Dacian military campaigns. Uh, his, his, those two campaigns that I've already mentioned, divided in the center by a victory, writing on a shield. Uh, one, there's been a lot of speculation. There's nothing like this earlier in Roman art quite like this. Uh, and so it is a new innovation, probably at the behest of, a po 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 possibly out of the mind, the creative mind, of Apollodorus of Damascus. And some scholars have suggested, and I think very convincingly, it's an intriguing idea, <coughs> that because this was located between two libraries, the likelihood, and that the Romans had scrolls, the likelihood is what we are dealing here, with here is one of these scrolls sort of wrapped around the column from base to top, uh, unfurled and wrapped around the column from base to uh, top with the text removed, with images instead of text. Uh, and that, that makes a lot of sense, again, given that you could view it most best from the two libraries on either side. A detail of the base, just to show you how very well preserved the sculptural decoration is. This is not a course in sculpture. I'm not going to go into this in detail. But I want to quickly show you some of the scenes, because again, they can be revealing from the point of view of architecture. This is at the very base. We see a personification of the Danube River uh, in that par area up north in Dacia, uh, where the Romans went to conquer uh, those tribes. Uh, and, you s and this is very important, because we know that Apollodorus of Damascus was responsible for building a bridge over the Danube bridge, uh, River. It was one of his great engineering feats. And you actually see that bridge uh, located here, which even increases the likelihood uh, that Apollodorus of Damascus was the designer of this particular structure. You see the Roman soldiers have gotten off boats. They're walking through uh, a, uh, an archway. Here you see the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers did not only do battle, uh, but they also uh, Romanized the areas that they went. We've talked about this a lot, the colonization of the Roman world, Trajan extending the borders to their furthest most points. The Romans get there. What do they do? They start to build architecture. They start to build walls with headers and stretchers. They start to build uh, forts uh, and, and city walls in which they put buildings with Roman amenities. Remember, uh, after, war is, after the war is over, they're often given land uh, by the general or the emperor uh, to, to uh, it becomes theirs and where they can live from that point on. So they had every reason to want to uh, fill these towns with Roman amenities. And we see the Roman soldiers building cities in many of these scenes. This is the most famous scene from the column in which we see a battle between the Romans inside one of these forts that they've built 
Uh, they are all with helmets and shields. They have their hands around something. We think these were probably spears that were added in metal originally. The Dacians down below, you can identify them by their leggings and tunics and scraggly hair and beards here. Uh, they are attacking the camp. The Romans are, of course, going to be victorious, but the Dacians are shown as heroic and valiant and, and enemies who are pretty much the equals of the Roman and Romans in strength, which only underscores that the Romans were stronger still to have conquered them. Uh, and then over here, if you've ever wondered where the term battering ram came from, you can see it right here. Told you the Romans invented everything. Uh, you can see it right here, uh, this pole with a ram's head at the end, uh, which is serving again as a battering ram as they try to tear down the walls of the Roman fort. Uh, per perhaps the most poignant and interesting scene happens way up at the top of the column, uh, where the leader of the Dacians, Decebalus, D-E-C-E-B-A-L-U-S, is shown kneeling almost like one of those victories on the, uh, on the bull. Uh, he has a, uh, a knife in his hand. What is he doing? He is kneeling here. He has decided. You can see the Romans. He's got Romans to the left of him, Romans to the right of him. He's about to be taken prisoner by them and paraded in a triumphal procession in Rome uh, in honor of Trajan. He doesn't want to do that, so he heroically, valiantly takes his own life. He is about to plunge that knife into his heart. Uh, so that he doesn't have to be taken by the Romans. It's very interesting to see them uh, depicting, the Romans depicting the Dacians in such a, uh, in such a heroic uh, way on this column. I mentioned the museum in Rome that is located in Aor, the Museo della Civiltà Romana, the Museum of, the, uh, of Roman Civilization that has casts and models. I mentioned that they had casts of all the scenes from the Column of Trajan. I show you a view that I took in that museum just to give you a sense uh, of how one can see those and how one can see those at eye's level uh, to get a good sense of them. In antiquity, they would have been harder to read, uh, but I should point out that the uh, background was likely painted blue, and there probably would have been some additions, like the metal spears, that might have made it easier to read, almost like Wedgwood might have made it easier to read uh, in antiquity. <coughs> and I also thought I would mention, I'm sure all of you have been down to ground zero, but if you go a block or two away from ground zero itself, there's a fireman's memorial there that was put up to many of the firemen who sadly lost their lives uh, fighting those fires in the Twin Towers. Uh, we see this here dedicated to those who fell and to those who carry on. Uh, here and what's interesting about this, if you look, at, if you Google this and look at the website for the Firemen's Memorial in Rome, in in uh, New York, uh, you will find out that the uh, designer for this talks unabashedly of his admiration for the Column of Trajan in Rome, and that he used as an artistic model uh, for the way in which he massed figures here, shown them in relationship to buildings. He used as his model uh, the figures on the Column of Trajan in Rome. At the end, again, the column uh, surrounded by the Greek and Latin libraries, the temple uh, over here at the end. You can see it's a conventional Roman temple, deep porch, freestanding columns, uh, uh, staircase, one staircase facade orientation, just as we saw uh, elsewhere. Uh, here we see an engraving showing the, uh, the spiral staircase that leads from bottom to top, and over here that the staircase also goes down below. Uh, and into a, a burial chamber. Two urns were found in that burial chamber, the urns of Trajan and Plotina, which tells us, of course, that this also served as Trajan's tomb. So victory, uh, not only his great, one of his great victories, military victories, but also victory over death. And then at the apex, uh, we see a good view of the top with the statue of St. Peter, but we have coins uh, depicting uh, Trajan, uh, on, uh, depicting the original statue, the base, the shaft, a, a, a portrait of Trajan, uh, a naked portrait of Trajan, a heroicized portrait of Trajan depicted after death, divinized at the apex of the column. And if you read uh, the inscription on the coin, you see it refers to Trajan as Optimus Princeps. Trajan received many titles. One was Dacicus, D-A-C-I-C-U-S, for his victories over the Dacians. But at the end of his life, Optimus Princeps, the greatest Princeps of all time. The implication, greater than Augustus. And it is arguable, I think probably correct, uh, that Trajan was the even greater of the two. This is a, a restored view, a spectacular restored view of the building. 
complex where you can see again uh, the entranceway over here, the equestrian statue, everything that we've described. But I think it's interesting, if you think of yourself having entered into this forum, standing here, looking back at the Basilica bearing Trajan's <coughs> name, uh, looking toward the column in the temple, what you would have likely seen when you stood here was only the uppermost part of the column, because most of it would have been blocked by the very tall Basilica Ulpia. So it's a very theatrical uh, representation in the sense that you would be uh, you know, standing here with Trajan during life, looking back toward that column, uh, looking back at the divinization of, of Trajan, bronze statue, which would have seemed as if it was floating on top of the Basilica Ulpia. This is a very dramatic tableau uh, created here by Apollodorus of Damascus, and I think it was not equal, uh, equaled until the 17th century by architects like Jean Lorenzo Bernini, who also created such spectacular tableaus. Uh, just to show you again the location of the markets of Trajan in relationship to the Forum of Trajan, while the, mark, while the Forum was the Romans imposing a rectangular plan on nature, remember they have to cut back the hill to make way for it, the markets are something quite different. They are the Romans accepting the shape of the remaining Quirinal Hill and allowing the shape of that hill to determine uh, the irregular shape of the markets. The markets, uh, unlike the the, the uh, forum that is made out of marble, for the most part, as we've <coughs> seen, variegated marble. The markets are made out of a concrete faced with brick, a very different material, but a material that is absolutely appropriate when you want to cover a hillside uh, with tiered buildings, looking back very much to the spot, Baia, looking back to the Fortuna Prima Genia at Palestrina, the same idea to, chain, to turn this hill, what remained of the Quirinal Hill, into essentially the precursor of the modern shopping mall. You have shopping, there are 150 shops uh, in the markets of Trajan. Uh, the, all of these things date, by the way, to the same period, around AD 113, the Forum and also the markets. Uh, we see 150 <coughs> shops here on a variety of levels. This is the uh, bottom level that is located where the exedra, the first exedra is on the right side, a great hemicycle with shops. Uh, here a street uh, called the Via B. Verotica, that name is on your monument list, and then a covered bazaar uh, up here. All of this on different levels, all of this done in a very innovative way with concrete faced with brick. Uh, you can also see here the very large windows, a semi-dome that I'll show you in detail in a moment. These large windows indicate to us that the architects are real masters of the concrete medium here, able to dematerialize uh, the uh, wall by uh, putting up these very, very large windows. That's how good they were in building this at this point. The, the, the building block here is essentially the taberna, not unlike what we saw in Pompeii, uh, this small uh, space with a barrel vault, an attic window above, and in this case with uh, a, a post and lintel uh, scheme made out of travertine to mark the entranceway into the shop. They took this individual um, motif and they, they replicated it throughout this building over and over and over <coughs> again, offering 150 possibilities. Here you see a series of these in a row, series of these taberni with their attic windows, with their travertine decoration, uh, with their sidewalks, a kind of mini city within a city, uh, and then over here the polygonal masonry of the streets, looking very much like streets in Rome. Here is a view of the great hemicycle down on the first story. You see the shops again. What's interesting here is in the second story you see arcuated elements. You can see the, the facing with um, the brick facing, although we do believe this was stuccoed over in this case. Here, pilasters, but look very carefully. You will see these pilasters support in the center an arcuated pediment, and then on either side these broken triangular pediments, as if the pediment has broken, been broken to allow the, uh, the arcuated pediment to show through. We have never seen that before. Yes, we saw it in the paper topics, but that stuff is later. We have not seen that up to this point chronologically in built architecture. We have seen it in painting, cubiculum at the Met over here, for example, this breaking the triangular <coughs> pediment to allow something else to show through. This is the beginning of this experimentation that ultimately leads to this Baroque element in Roman architecture that I'm going to talk about. Behind the semi-hemicycle, se uh, semi annular vault uh, with an additional set of shops and attic windows uh, there as well.
This is the most famous street uh, from the forum, uh, from the markets of Trajan's. It's an incredible place to wander, by the way. And they have just recently, in the last couple of years, opened an entirely new museum here, uh, which has a lot of remains uh, from the uh, forum and uh, from the markets, and a great deal of very useful information. An absolute must see for anyone going to Rome. This is the famous Via Biberatica of the markets of Trajan, where again you get the sense once you're in here that you're in a kind of city within a city, uh, but with all these wonderful shops. Uh, you can see how skilled they are in using ramps uh, with polygonal masonry as well as sidewalks and stairs uh, so that you can make your way up uh, with either alternatives here. Again, the tabernae on either side, the opening up of the walls uh, with these incredible uh, windows throughout. A, a restored view of what the whole thing looked like in antiquity, the hemicycle, uh, that the, the, uh, the decoration here of the central arcuated pediment, broken triangular pediments over here, a very interesting space that I'm going to show you in a second, vaulted with a semi-dome done out of concrete with very large windows opening up the space, the Via Biberatica that we already saw here, and then the covered bazaar up there. A quick view of the semi-dome made out of concrete. It doesn't have an oculus, but otherwise it looks kind of like the, uh, the uh, dome of the Temple of Mercury at Baia, as you can see. And over here, this wall that I've already described uh, that shows you how well the Romans can work concrete now, enabling them to open up the wall uh, much more than they've been able to do so before and allow even more light into the structure. The greatest part, perhaps, of the markets of Trajan is this a building here. It's the covered bazaar, and it really is a market bazaar on two tiers. Uh, you can see in this restored view this series of tabernae down below, the attic up above. Uh, you can see that groin vaults are used here in an incredible way. I'll show you in a moment how. A second story up here with additional tabernae opened almost completely to the sky. Uh, an incredible <coughs> uh, feat on the part of Apollodorus of Damascus, assuming he also uh, designed these markets. Here is the market hall as it looks today. What is its ancestor? Uh, the uh, Ferentino market hall that we saw way back when with its single barrel vault or some of the cryptoporticuses that we also saw with their barrel vaults. It's that idea, that market hall idea, but look how sophisticated the Romans have become in their use of concrete faced with brick. They have realized that they don't even need a wall to support vaults. They can lift their vault on top of individual piers, as they have done so spectacularly here. Lift them up. I described this, I think, in the introductory level lecture as, in a sense, opening up a series of umbrellas over the space. They have opened it up uh, so that light can flow in <laughs> from the sides, light can flow in uh, from, uh, from either long end, uh, just flooding the whole system with light. Down below, again, the typical markets with their, with their uh, attic windows above. But this is a real tour de force, probably the greatest, certainly the greatest vaulting uh, that we have seen thus far. And again, a test to just how far the Romans have come from this uh, to this by the time of the Emperor Trajan. And, and any of you headed to San Francisco, uh, if you go to the, um, to the marketplace there, uh, you will see that that owes so much uh, to Roman antiquity with all the tabernae-like structures on either side, the vaulting. I mean, it's this sort of thing absolutely presupposes uh, this kind of architectural development. In the one minute that remains, and that's all I need uh, for this, I just want to show you one last monument and make one basic point about it that really has more to do with the transition from Trajan to Hadrian than anything else. Uh, an arch went up in, not in Rome, but in a place called Benevento, which is about uh, an hour's drive from, uh, from Naples uh, in the south of Italy and Campania. A place called Benevento, an arch went up between 114 to 118, honoring Trajan and all of Trajan's accomplishments. You can see it's covered with sculpture, uh, and each of those scenes uh, represents one of the accomplishments of Trajan. It was put up on the so-called Via Traiana, taking Trajan's name, uh, a road that was built from Rome to Benevento uh, and was opened uh, during Trajan's reign. <coughs> and again, a compendium of all his accomplishments. You can see very clearly that it is based in general form on the Arch of Titus in Rome, the single central arcuated bay 
the pedestals uh, supporting double columns on either side, the inscription at the top, the receding, uh, receding uh, panels on either side of that inscription. The major difference, of course, between the two, that this has sculpture only on the inside and sparingly uh, in the center and around the frieze. And this has much more sculpture, again, telling us in much greater detail uh, a list or describing uh, a list of the great accomplishments of Trajan. The main reason that I show it to you today, besides to show that the, the, Ves the, that the Flavians, again, served Flavian architecture served as an important model uh, for uh, Trajanic architecture, is that a couple of the scenes in the, uh, in the attic above are very interesting and tell us something about the succession. Hadrian does not appear in the lower part of the arch in any of the scenes, but he appears in two of the scenes in the uppermost part, which has led scholars, I think, rightly to conclude that the arch was finished up to the, uh, to the attic before Trajan's death and that Hadrian finished it. And what did he do? He put his own portrait up there with Trajan's. Why was he motivated to do that? Well, he had an ego, as we'll see when we talk about Hadrian's architecture. But more than that, it had something to do with the succession. We know that Trajan died uh, on August 8th in 117 AD. We know that on August 8th, he had no successor officially chosen. Plotina, his wife, was crazy. She had no children of her own. She's crazy about Hadrian, very much his sponsor, and wanted to see him succeed Trajan. It's likely that Trajan had the same idea in mind, but it's a little strange because wouldn't he then have adopted him before his death? Why would he have waited? Uh, but Plotina decides, she consults with advisors, she said, we're not going to announce Trajan's death. We're going to keep it a secret. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to announce that Trajan has adopted Hadrian. That happens on <laughs> August 9th. Uh, and then it was only on the 11th, that 11th of August, that Trajan's death was announced to the public. So some hanky-panky was going on uh, behind the scenes. But whoever made the choice, whether it was Trajan himself or Plotina, uh, he, they made a great choice. Hadrian, an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary emperor as well. And the, point that I, the one point that I want you to hold and keep with you over break and bring back uh, when, we, when we get back together and talk when we get back together about the Pantheon and Hadrian's villa at Tivoli. The main point that I want you to keep in mind is what we learned from the Forum of Trajan, and that is that Trajan combined in an incredible way with the help of Apollodorus traditional architecture in the form of the Forum with its marble, marble columns and the like, and innovative Roman architecture in the form of the brick-faced the brick concrete uh, market brought those together in one building in a way that is very different from anything we've seen up to this point. And we're going to see that Hadrian keeps that tradition alive, not only in the Pantheon, but also in his villa of Tivoli. Take care. Good, good spring break to everybody.